Hello, everybody. So uh, uh, we're going to start the uh, uh, second uh, session now. I'm uh, Athanasios Orfanidis and will serve as chair and uh, the most important role timekeeper uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the session. So uh, uh, this session will focus on, on bailouts and, and housing uh, finance. We have two presentations by uh, uh, members of the shadow, uh, Debbie Lucas and, uh, and Gregory Hess. But before we start, uh, I want to note that we grouped these two particular issues under a broader title for the session, Financial Policy 10 Years After the uh, Crisis. And this is to mark the uh, uh, 10th year anniversary of the uh, 2008 crisis and the beginning of a discussion about uh, lessons uh, and remaining challenges. So what um, uh, we plan to do is discuss issues related to, uh, um, to the crisis uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and where we are headed uh, in, uh, in, in forthcoming uh, meetings of the Shadow Committee, not just uh, in, uh, in today's session. Pertinent also to this discussion is, uh, is the short book distributed uh, to you today uh, on uh, reforming uh, financial regulation by uh, uh, committee member uh, uh, Charlie uh, uh, Calumiris. So reflecting on, the, uh, on, on financial policy 10 years after the crisis, uh, one natural question is whether uh, US authorities have done enough to improve the resilience of the financial system. Another way to state the question is, are we ready for the next crisis? And there is an active debate on this. Uh, uh, in my view, uh, uh, some progress has been made, but uh, insufficient action has been taken. And part of the difficulty is lack of consensus on, on some issues, disagreement about lessons that, uh, that could be drawn from the crisis. And this is why it's important to, uh, to continue to, to discuss this issue and, and push for additional progress going forward. So. Um, Today's discussion, um, we're going to focus on two issues where progress is, uh, is needed. Uh, the first paper will be presented by uh, uh, Debbie Lucas on the financial crisis bailouts, what they cost taxpayers, and who reap the direct benefits. As Debbie discusses, careful cost-benefit analysis is essential to place the discussion on a proper uh, basis. And uh, the question is, how do you do this? It's not, it's not a simple task, uh, and Debbie has done quite a bit of work, and it's going to be the focus on, on just making sure we understand uh, how, to do, how to do the numbers uh, uh, right uh, uh, and, and, and move this discussion forward. Second paper by, uh, uh, by Greg Hess is on uh, Fannie Mae and, Medi and Freddie Mac reloaded. Now, here we have uh, 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 government-sponsored institutions that we have discussed in the, uh, uh, in the past at our meeting. Uh, well, uh, I, I recall one recommendation that was made at some point is that maybe they should be taken in the back room and shot. Uh, this has not yet happened. So this is one of those situations where even though the, the adverse role of these government-sponsored institutions is beyond dispute, we have a situation that remains somewhat in limbo, and uh, uh, final status has not yet been uh, determined. Of course, when we have unfinished business like this, it does not improve confidence on the readiness to handle the next uh, crisis. And this is why we want to keep discussing these issues, uh, uh, hopefully um, uh, encouraging uh, uh, better solutions going forward. So let's move on right away to the presentations. Debbie. Well, um this is a big topic, um, bailouts. Um, 10 years after the financial crisis, there's lots of events commemorating what happened, and there's been a resurgence of interest in bailouts and their consequences. Um, my fellow academics seem to largely support the interventions, the help to the rescues of financial institutions on the logic that um, having let them fail would have been worse for the economy 
than um, the consequences of the rescue. Um, but I would say that there's definitely not a consensus on that, and the deviations are on both sides. Um, there's people who have argued that actually more should have been done, that perhaps bailing out Lehman would have prevented um, the extent of the panic, or even that instead of helping the banks, we should have helped homeowners and thereby helped the banks indirectly, but bailed out um, more people. Um, on the other side, there's those who think that unsecured creditors should have been allowed to take bigger losses, maybe let the banks fail and then do something the next day, but don't bail them out at the point that the unsecured creditors got so much money. It doesn't matter, I'm kind of in that camp, but I, my view doesn't matter for the purposes of this talk. Um, and and any, anyway, a popular view is that taxpayers um, were forced to pay a lot to rich bankers and people are still quite angry about that. Um, so swirling around behind all of this is these large and unresolved disagreements about what the bailouts actually costs. Um, when I went out to look what people were saying, on one end I found an article in Forbes that claimed that the bailouts actually cost about $18 trillion. Um, on the other side, ProPublica, a quite reputable journalistic organization, kept a tally of cash into and out of the government um, from TARP and Fannie and Freddie, and they concluded that the government made a profit of about $86 billion. Um, in fact, um, President Obama picked up on that kind of cash accounting, and he was fond of saying that taxpayers got back every dime from the auto industry and the banks. Um, so obviously, um, wide differences of opinion philosophically and quantitatively. And um, I think it's also clear that distaste for the bailouts drove um, Dodd-Frank and the many provisions aimed at ending bailouts forever. Okay, so against that backdrop, and in the hope of establishing some common ground, I wanted to look into some of the basic questions about bailouts. Fundamentally, what do we want to call a bailout and what isn't a bailout? And then looking at the post-financial crisis bailouts, um, how much do they cost? What's the right theoretical way to look at the cost and what happens in practice, why it matters, who are the direct beneficiaries, and what are the implications for future policies? Um, so I guess I want to justify for just a second why I'm so focused on direct cost measurement. Obviously, there's um, costs and benefits, direct and indirect. Um, but this is a starting point. Um, direct cost measurement is essential, as Astanasio said, for credible cost-benefit analysis. Did the benefits justify the costs? We can't know unless we know what the costs are. Or could the results have been achieved at a lower cost? So we really need to think about that. And also for ongoing policy making, I think there's a lot of questions now looking back at the regulatory structure that's been developed post-crisis to eliminate bailouts. Are the benefits of those regulations in excess of the costs that they impose on the financial system? Um, and then maybe bro more broadly, um, I think that if we could come to a more common understanding of the costs and the beneficiaries, it might help reconcile the widely divergent perceptions about the fairness of what happened and the size and the incidence of the cost. So um, with that, just to spend a minute on the definition, um, a bailout is actually a colloquial term. I went to Wikipedia and they gave a nice definition which it says it's a colloquial term for the provision of financial help to a corporation or country which otherwise would be on the brink of failure or bankruptcy. Um, it's a very good working definition, um, but I felt I needed to give it a little more substance. So I'm going to call something a bailout for the purposes of this analysis if it's a rescue that involves a value transfer arising from a subsidy or an implicit guarantee or from new legislation passed in response to significant financial distress. But I don't want to call it a bailout if essentially it's been paid for um, by the affected industry or the affected group. So if there was an ex-ante insurance premium that was fair, it's not a bailout. If your house burns down and you get a big check from the insurance company, 
it's not a bailout. You've paid for it. And also, if there's an ex post mechanism for collecting money um, from the industry, as there is in the case of the FDIC, which I'll mention if there's time, I also don't want to consider that a bailout. OK. Um, so I'm um, sorry. This is a little, these are the bits of the theory pieces, but I think they're extremely important. So in, in um, this issue of bailout cost measurement, it's more subtle than you might think. In fact, there's at least three different metrics that one could use, but I want to focus on two of them because they give you starkly different answers as to the total cost of these activities. Um, the first is a forward-looking metric. I would say it's the net present value of the anticipated consequences of the bailout actions, both cash inflows and outflows, on a fair value basis at the time the bailout is granted. So when the legislation is passed or when the administrative rule is changed. Um, that concept is forward looking. It takes into account all possible outcomes. The crisis could have gotten worse as well as getting better. And it also recognizes that the cost of risk to the economy was high at the time that those actions was taken and that makes those actions more expensive. So that's my preferred measure of bailout cost. Um, what you often see, and some of the examples I cited were exactly along these lines, is what I'd call an ex post sum of realized cash flows, so ex post cash accounting. And that's problematic. It's misleading because it's only looking at one possible outcome, not at the universe of possible outcomes at the time of the bailout. And sort of by construction, bailouts happen when things are bad. But if things get better, we tend to get paid back. And usually things do get better. So we get this kind of distorted view about how little, little things cost. OK. Um, so in terms of the numbers I'm about to point you to, um, it, a lot of my estimates come from what was available in the literature um, that was conceptually correct on the basis I just described on a forward-looking um, fair value basis. And CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, is my source for many of these numbers um, because philosophically they share the view that that's the right way to, to measure things. Um, but oftentimes there isn't a government estimate that's right. Oftentimes there's only cash estimates. So a few of the estimates are ones of my own making. I also want to point out that there's other government estimates that are underestimates because governments tend to use their own borrowing rate as their cost of capital, no matter the risk, and that causes them to underestimate the cost of things. I've written about it extensively elsewhere. I won't belabor it here. Um, so please turn to table one in the paper, because that's where there's the summary of the costs as I estimate them. And um, the bottom line is that the major US post-crisis bailouts totaled about $489 billion in present value costs by these calculations, the largest being Fannie and Freddie at $291 billion. Um, this totaled about 3.4% of 2009 GDP. Um, I'm, I'm going to take the time that I have. Um, which is a bit, <laughs> and um, point out some details about some of these things. Um, if you're wondering what's in the other column, that's the Small Business Lending Fund and Income Driven Repayment on Student Loans. Um, those are both pretty much under the radar. You can think of the Small Business Lending Fund as mini TARP for community banks. Um, so, um, in any case, let me, um, let me talk about the details of some of them in a second. But first, I want to mention a few takeaways. Um, so how should we think about this $489 billion, assuming that you um, think it's right? It wasn't trillions of dollars, and it wasn't free. Um, so in my view, it is big enough to raise serious questions about whether taxpayers could have been better protected. And at the same time, I do think it's small enough to take seriously the trade-offs between the costs and benefits of new regulations um, that are designed to reduce the chance of future bailouts. So I think it's an interesting number um, because it makes you, I think it should make you pay attention. Um, I also want to say a word on who benefited from the bailouts, at least directly. Um, 
It wasn't the bankers. To the extent the bankers were equity holders, the equity holders were largely wiped out by the time that the bailouts actually occurred. Um, really, the largest beneficiaries were the unsecured creditors of large financial institutions, particularly of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And um, it, to me, it's interesting because we can't actually identify who these entities were. Presumably, they were financial institutions all over the world, mutual funds and so forth. Um, it, it is true that the bankers do benefit from the presence of underpriced guarantees, from implicit guarantees, but that's before the bailouts actually happen. So if you think about just the status quo situation where you might be bailed out, it allows institutions to borrow at lower rates than they otherwise would, and that benefit goes into higher stock prices. So there is this ex ante benefit, but it's orders of magnitude smaller than the kind of costs that I'm estimating here ex post. So if you look at the paper, you'll see some of those ex ante kinds of calculations too. Um, since we're here to talk about monetary policy, um, I want to start by talking about my number for the Federal Reserve, was that they provided bailouts of about $21 billion. Um, in fact, worries that the Fed had overstepped um, in terms of providing fiscal policy in the form of bailouts is one of the reasons that Dodd-Frank included provisions that restricted them from taking some of the actions that they took during the financial crisis. Um, actually, 21 billion is a very small number compared to the trillions of dollars ex of exposure that the Fed had through those various facilities. So I take this as actually a very small bailout cost from the Fed. Why do I come up with such a small number? Well, I think it was interesting. For one, um, on some of the riskier things that they did, there was actually Treasury backing from TARP that was in a first loss position to absorb some of that risk, and that reduced the exposure of the Fed to zero in most cases, not in every case. Um, there were other things I did that were risky, such as Maiden Lane, um, where they were taking on a lot of risk, but supposedly the transactions occurred at fair value. So I wouldn't call that a subsidy. I would say they were taking on risk, and you could argue about whether that was OK or not. Um, and then on a cash basis, I think the Federal Reserve ultimately probably came out ahead, but I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Um, OK, good. Doing good. So that's, that's really all I want to say about the Fed. Um, I also want to talk about the FDIC, because I think that was in, um, of interest to people in this room, and people haven't um, talked about it in terms of being a bailout so much. So what the FDID, FDIC did um, was two major things, and they did this under existing administrative authority. One is that they increased deposit insurance from 100,000 to 250,000. That was a temporary increase that was made permanent by Dodd-Frank. They also instituted a temporary liquidity guarantee program um, that, among other things, put unlimited coverage on transaction accounts in return for fees, and banks could opt into that program. Um, that was a significant increase in FDIC risk exposure, arguably, at the time. It basically brought in all the uninsured deposits under FDIC coverage, at least temporarily. However, um, my estimate of the bailout cost is only $10 billion. Why is that? Well, it's because by statute, the FDIC is required to recover um, losses ex post from solvent institutions. Um, and that's, it's always been that way. I think people think the FDIC puts taxpayers at risk. It could, but it would be a very tail event kind of situation. Um, what happens if the FDIC doesn't have the funds on hand to make banks whole? Well, what they do have on a standing basis is a $100 billion line of credit from the Treasury, and they could draw on that. And in fact, in conjunction with these emergency facilities, that line was increased from 100 to $500 billion during the crisis. Um, so the way I come up with a $10 billion subsidy is to say there was a small chance that that line would be drawn on in a large amount and that it wouldn't be fully recovered because the banks wouldn't be in the situation to pay it back, or at least they wouldn't pay it back in full. Um, so that's so. So basically, that's a, a very again a very small cost compared to the exposure that the FDIC had. Um, 
Okay, we're doing good. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a little bit to the big ones. Um, but I'm gonna let Greg mostly talk about Fannie and Freddie, and I talked about them here um, last time I spoke. Um, but the biggest bailout was Fannie and Freddie. The headline number that I'm using of 291 billion cost on a fair value basis comes from a Congressional Budget Office estimate that looked at projected default rates, recovery rates, prepayment rates, um, looked at market pricing to do the discounting and came to this conclusion. Um, 291 billion is a big number, and by no measure have they been paid back that number. Um, however, this is another place where cash accounting conflicts with present value accounting, because on a cash basis, Fannie and Freddie have more than paid back the Treasury. In fact, the Treasury has come out ahead by $58 billion. Um, I want to talk about another program that got, to me, surprisingly little attention, but involved what I consider a very large bailout, and it was very similar to F Fannie and Freddie. That is the Federal Housing Administration. So as you probably know, the Federal Housing Administration provides mortgage guarantees to low-income and first-time home buyers. Um, The same legislation that authorized the Treasury um, to take over Fannie and Freddie also authorized the FHA to increase the cap on the mortgages that they insure. And it also gave them the authority to guarantee up to $300 billion in new mortgages for subprime borrowers if lenders wrote the principal down to 90% of current appraised value. Um, that had a cost, all of that had a cost, but more importantly, in 2008, 2009, and 2010, the FHA made another $800 billion of mortgage guarantees at below market rates. And so when I take a subsidy rate from, again, from the Congressional Budget Office and apply it to that new business, and also add in a, a billion dollars for those expansions under HERA, I come to about $60 billion of a bailout for the Federal Housing Administration. That's a big number, and you probably haven't heard about it. Um, to me, the interesting question is why. Uh, my own explanation is the very arcane way that government credit programs are accounted for there was, bu there's always budget authority for these government credit programs to absorb losses. People worry, for instance, about the student loan program, what happens if they take a lot of losses? Well, at least there's the authorization for the government to cover it. And in the same way, there's this kind of reserve fund accounting for the FHA that makes it pretty easy to absorb the losses without making a lot of noise about it. So it, it's kind of hidden by the accounting, but it's a large number. The reason, even though it's an ongoing government program, I still think it's a bailout, because they were effectively doing the, exactly the same thing as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. To wit, they were providing credit guarantees on mortgages at below market prices. So it was very much the same line of business. Um, OK, the last thing. I'll mention then is um, the TARP. Uh, as you might remember, TARP authorized $700 billion um, to buy the troubled assets of financial institutions. Um, ultimately, money went to provide capital to large banks, to AIG. There were loans to the auto industry. There were some programs for homeowners. As I mentioned before, some of the money backed up Fed facilities and FDIC facilities. Um, so as far as the a fair value cost of TARP, uh, my number is at 90 billion. This is actually a figure where there's more other numbers out there, and this is kind of in the ballpark of what others um, have published. Um, this is in contrast to TARP on a cash basis, where a lot of money was recovered. But interestingly, at least according to CBO, um, the bottom line is it still costs $30 billion even on a cash basis because of the latter programs where not all the money was later recovered. Um, so I think I'll, um, I, I guess I want to 
advertise one more thing which isn't in the paper I gave you, which is you might notice from this discussion that a lot of what I'm calling a bailout is going through existing US credit programs, through the FHA, through student loans, and so forth. And um, earlier, I had written a paper for Brookings that made the argument that actually US credit programs provided as much fiscal stimulus to the economy um, during the Great Recession as the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which was the major fiscal action by Congress. And I think these these large bailouts that didn't get that much attention were related to that same thing, that the government does do a lot of policy through these credit programs that we don't often think of um, as bailouts in the same way as we think about bailouts of private sector financial institutions. So thank you. If you uh, bought a house in the last five years or so and you qualified for a conformable loan, it is likely that your loan was bought and securitized by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, two somewhat off-balance sheet government entities under government's conservatorship whose profits now flow into the U.S. budget and whose liabilities are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Of course, these packages of loans were likely purchased by another off-balance sheet U.S. government entity, the Federal Reserve System, as part of the sequence of their quantitative easing program. Welcome, everyone, to U.S. modern capitalism. The U.S. as a country is unique among all market-based economies for our peculiar infusion of government programming in housing finance, and not in a good way. Indeed, in a 20-year period starting in the mid to late 1980s, we have had two major crises tied to housing and real estate, and our approach has been to hodgepodge our way into a partial fix to meet a myriad of purposes, securitization, diversification of risk, regional variation of prices, access to housing finance for households with varieties of incomes, credit histories, and down payment abilities. And we do these programs in a way to, so that hopefully markets can effectively price this risk. Over time, we presume that these duct tape approaches are permanent. Rather, they are seemingly well-functioning dysfunctional arrangements, and they last until they don't. Let's look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who meaningfully and substantially contributed to the magnitude and duration of the Great Recession that began just 10 years ago. At the time, Fannie and Freddie, both government-sponsored enterprises, were publicly traded firms that intermediated mortgage-backed securities that had an implicit guaranteed by the federal government. Preceding the crisis, it was well known, well known, that Fannie and Freddie had too little capital, too much leverage in their balance sheets, duration mismatch problems in their portfolios, involvement in accounting scandals, and generously and questionably funded and lobbied political candidates on both sides of the political aisle. In turn, Fannie and Freddie turned their government-sponsored advantages, including the implicit guarantee of their securities and an allowance for lower capital standards than their competitors in the mortgage-backed securities market, they converted these advantages into, into strong profits for their shareholders. As a quid pro quo, however, for their special status, they face an enormous political burden from both sides of the aisle. Pressure built when Fannie and Freddie were encouraged and enabled to allow more families to be able to qualify for home loans by lowering their underwriting standards for a purchaser's down payment terms, credit and employment history backgrounds, et cetera. Again, it was a seemingly well-functioning, dysfunctional arrangement until it wasn't. We knew about it. We were unable to make the fundamental changes that were needed. Ten years later, 
Fanny and Freddie are reloaded. That is, they remain in a disproportionately large preferential market position called conservatorships. They are monopolies. They should be profitable. They're monopolies. And the government likes the revenue, even though, as Deborah has pointed out, as clearly as clearly can be, and the CBO has encouraged us to, to understand, these naive cash flows don't incorporate the underlying risks that were taken in the past to secure those flows, the time value of money, or the risks that lie ahead. This revenue is a tax, as pointed out, a not very well thought out tax. They are, these institutions are too big to fail, and the current tax revenue provides just enough temptation that there will not be a push for legislation to do anything until there is a big problem. Here we are again in a seemingly well-functioning, dysfunctional arrangement until we aren't. And we should not wait until the other shoe drops again. So what would have fixed the current status of Fannie and Freddie look like? I encourage you all to look at the CBO's analysis in August, to, uh, August of 2018, transition, entitled Transitioning to Alternative Structures for Housing Finance, an update. Bipartisan legislation has recently been proposed as well in September by retiring Congressman Jeb Henserling from Texas and co-sponsored by Congressman John Delaney uh, from Maryland, who's also retiring, and Jim Hines from Connecticut. These provide some insight, and once again, I underscore they're bipartisan, which is not a word that we use very often these days. In brief, their proposal wholeheartedly surrenders to the practical notion that we cannot return, return to a world where the federal government is uninvolved in guaranteeing mortgages that have been securitized. It does, however, eliminate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mae's charters, permanently ending their monopoly positions. In their place, Ginny May would guarantee qualified mortgages that are securitized by regulated, well-capitalized well private institution. These private credit enhancements insurance would be paid by issuers for their loans to be eligible to be included in these securities. These private credit enhancements would, would also help to fund a rainy day capital fund to support the system in periods of stress. These overlapping diversified pools of funds and insurance would, to the author's minds, provide sufficient protections to avoid future government bailouts. But there are fault lines within this, pro this proposal, given that it's, it has only slight efforts to widen home ownership to individuals and families with lower income, less collateral, or with weaker credit backgrounds. The authors of the legislation believe that serving low and moderate income households is what the FHA is for and what line items in the budget are for. Though it's not their explicit recommendation, subsidies to improve housing ownership for riskier buyers could, and I just say could, it's not my recommendation, could be directly funded by the government and on budget should they choose to do so through the government's you know, FHA insurance system on loans or through a pure income subsidy, rather than through a more convoluted market process to be priced and sorted out by private sector intermediaries. The simple reason is that private intermediaries are going to want to charge a higher price for riskier borrowers or not loan to them at all, which is, which is at odds with expanding home ownership to these same groups. And we, are, and we are doing financially stressed homeowners no favors if we ask them to take risks that make their fragile situations more fragile, whether it's subsidized at the margin or not. The good news is that the current bipartisan proposal removes the privileged position of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and crowds more capital into the system to lessen the chance that government bailouts will be needed. It is certainly not a dream proposal, even by their own accounts. 
it still places the f government's full faith and credit at the center, and, and at least as the backstop, at the center of housing finance, which is a market feature not imitated by other countries. However, given the U.S.'s attachment to the 30-year fixed rate mortgage with no prepayment penalty, our default laws, and our mostly on-again, on-again desire to raise home ownership rates, even for those who are not able to fully digest the risk, it may be the best policy reform we can even hope for until it's not. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. So uh, we have uh, some time to take um, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, you can address either to the panel or to individual members of the panel. If you can identify yourself and then uh, wait for a microphone to come by. Have a, a first question here, and then I'll go the back. Um, I guess this could be for both of you. Uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Gregory has mentioned that uh, uh, Fannie Mae was, uh, and Freddie Mac had very low capital. Uh, as I recall, during that decade before the financial crisis, they maybe had one or two percent capital, and if that, and they were not even reporting that. They took their financial statements for years in arrears. Sure. Um, what exactly was the sequence of that? At what point, were they insolvent well before the financial crisis? In retrospect, or uh, well, I can. I don't think they were insolvent before. Um, actually, I did an estimate of what was going on with them, so I have some numbers in my head. So um, they had around two percent capital against the mortgages on their um, balance sheet, but only uh, about half a percent on the MBS, where they provided a credit guarantee, but it was off balance sheet. So it was really where they were bitten during the crisis was the high default rates and that relatively small amount of um, capital against that credit protection, if you will. Um, uh, you want to take any other? No, I, the, you know they. Uh, you know it, it, would, it had been pointed out for many years by Federal Reserve officials and others that that was uh, problematic. And uh, you know, uh, pr pleasantly ignored uh, throughout that that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One issue in general with the structure of Fannie and Freddie, which is a bad idea, is that by creating these giant monoline insurers, you're not getting any of the diversification of risk at, that you do in banks. So if you think about, say, the European model of housing finance, where um, that risk is essentially with banks, it's diversified against other sectors going wrong. So that lack of diversification can make a medium-sized shock in housing more systemic than it would have otherwise been. Right. And there in the back? Alan Maltz, Columbia University. So some of the 2008-2009 uh, programs uh, were uh, started with very large authorizations, and some of them ended up either lending much less, for example, TALF, than originally authorized, or not lending at all, such as the, the money market uh, mutual fund program. But ex ante, the exposure was potentially very, very great. In the end, they didn't lend as much as initially anticipated, and either there weren't runs on the money funds or spreads on structured products came in very sharply, and so the, the outcome was, uh, was much more benevolent than, than anticipated. Does that ex ante material probability of a gigantic loss somehow figure into the way you've done the estimates? It did. So um, the number I was quoting came from a CBO report that I was heavily involved in um, writing, and we struggled with exactly the issues that you're just talking about. But conceptually, we looked at um, the total capacity, but did assume that they wouldn't necessarily all be drawn upon. So basically, we were looking at um, a distribution of possible outcomes and what the losses would be 
in different future states of the world. In none of them was there, you know, a trillion dollar draw, basically. You know, that was unlikely, to, but, but in many of them, less was ultimately used than what went into the estimates. Um, but, but more fundamentally, in most of those facilities, the reason we attributed a zero cost to them was because they really were very short term. They did demand good collateral and so forth. So um, they're, they're, the Fed was being pretty careful in most cases to have protection against losses. Um, I'm comfortable with those numbers, but I would, if I had to choose a sign for whether they were aggressive or conservative, I would say the cost estimate is a bit conservative. Yes, over there. Yeah, um, you haven't touched on some of the differences with some of the other earlier kind of bailout or, pro or bust episodes like the SNL crisis or the aftermath of the 2001 uh, tech boom. And to what extent do you feel that some of the debate about distribution consequences and uh, the prohibitions against further bailouts was affected by the perception of uh, non of, of non prosecution of people who were involved in senior positions in some of these actions, whether or not, without getting into the fairness of individual cases, do you really need to have somebody's head paraded around on a pike in order to be able to build a consensus of political support for what is basically a broad societal bailout? Fairly or unfairly, justified or unjustified, it would have. It, it would have uh, kind of ended what I kind of think of as like the political war on intermediation that took place for eight, ten years after the crisis. I, I think that was, you know, th there was a whole time period of pitchforks and torches where people were just angry. Uh, they knew that it was not in their best interest to keep the war on intermediation going. But they did it anyway, and I, and I mean household. People are just so mad at the banks, even though, as we know, without financial intermediation, you know, things, things slow down very quickly in the U.S. economy. I, I think it was, is a key piece of it. I don't know if that's changed in, in the future. There was, a, there was a little bit of that in kind of the, the, the late 80s, you know, kind of real estate crisis. You know, there was the Keating Five, and there was all sorts of conversation about that. There, were, there, there was a little bit more finger pointing there. Those people tended to move on, except for a couple of them, to, to good careers. Uh, but I, I think if there had been more prosecution uh, and the identification of people who had uh, done, uh, you know, willful uh, uh, misconduct, uh, that it probably would have made things go faster. So I'm going to mm -hmm. give, just Please. for the sake of debate, let me say that, and this isn't, I agree that more could be said about the historical bailouts, and I think people do feel like it's happened too many times and the banking system has gotten bailed out, and that's costly to taxpayers. Um, but I do want to say that even on the current bailouts, I think there were definitely equity questions that even for me were not satisfactorily addressed. So for instance, um, I was a strong proponent during the crisis of having the FHA and Fannie and Freddie um, basically refinance any performing mortgage without checking for whether it satisfied the loan to value kinds of criteria on the grounds that they already have the credit risk. So why not allow um, people access to these lower interest rates? It wouldn't have made Fannie and Freddie any worse off. It did make the MBS holders worse off because it would allow people to prepay mortgages that were performing at a higher, at actually what was then an above market rate. Right. Um, so they could hold on to that. And the story I hope heard anecdotally um, in Washington was that actually the unsecured or the, the MBS holders were extremely against right. that policy change, <laughs> but they could have done that and it would have had the effect of lowering defaults and of helping the bank. So they did make some decisions about how they provided that assistance. That is, you could have bailed out the homeowners first and that would have gone to the banks. People also weren't happy with that, but um, so I think there. I think there was a lot of distributional issues that deserve even now to look back and kind of discuss what we would want to do in the future and what would have been more fair. Deborah, great, great. I love your piece. I have a question. Um, what about um, AIG and 
Bear Stearns, and particularly on AIG, um, the, the kind of ex post settlement where the, um, you know, where the derivative, counterparty derivative exposure was marked to par rather than current market value and the cost. And you know, maybe you could comment on that. And I have just one other question. Why, um, why was it the Fed rather than the U.S. Treasury that, that um, you know, was, t took the lead in, in the AIG bailout? Those are good questions I should know the answer to, and I don't completely. But I will say that in the case of AIG, the risk was all on TARP. It wasn't on the Fed. So I, at least my understanding is, so in, so for instance, um, I also participated in this congressional oversight panel that valued all the assistance through TARP, and AIG was a big piece in that. They, they hired Duffin Phelps to do a fair valuation of everything that TARP paid for. And um, AIG was definitely counted under that. So I don't consider AIG. Um, so the Fed, there was actually a lot of teamwork, which I think was a good thing, given the severity of the situation, because they had to coordinate. Uh, so Treasury was coordinating with the Fed, with the FDIC. Um, and, but I think that did create some confusion about who was bearing the risk. On Bear Stearns, I need to look more carefully, and I haven't. It, for some reason, it hasn't been high on people's radar for having high bailout costs. Maybe someone in the audience even knows. Uh, Debbie, just to follow up, you're, I think you allude to this in your, <clears throat> in your paper, but one of the big costs or potential benefits that stem from these, of course, are the indirect costs, moral hazard, and other things. Some people would argue had Bear Stearns been allowed to fail, Mer uh, Lehman would never happen. Um, how do you think about those? And um, I mean, it's important to quantify the, the, the direct cost, but it's actually the indirect cost of the policy actions that sound a little large out there for policymakers. Okay. Thank you. And I do, in, in the bigger paper I'm writing on the topic I'm about to launch into, talking about the indirect costs and benefits, but I think it's tricky. So let me start out with what I think must be in most of your minds, which is that bailouts create moral hazard and that when financial institutions have the prospect of a bailout, they're going to take more risk and that's just going to exacerbate the situation. Um, you're never going to believe me, and no one ever. But but long for a long time in the literature, Bob Merton in the 70s and Alan Marcus um, made the very important point that actually bailouts like monopoly power create franchise value in financial institutions. As as I mentioned, what a bailout. The prospect of a bailout lowers an institution's borrowing cost, and that creates a stream of rents that's valuable to the institution. So the incentives for risk taking can actually go either way, because franchise value creates risk aversion until you're actually underwater. So this is, I mean, the math says that the incentive could go either way on, on risk taking. Um, I think there's some other serious indirect effects. Um, a lot of people have pointed out that the result of this assistance to large financial institutions is they're even bigger than they were before the crisis. As Greg just talked about, Fannie Mae and Freddie are even more systemic than they were before the crisis. So it's created just the whole process of having the government come in and take large financial market actions has, I think has bad consequences. I know it's not satisfactory, but at least it's what I'm thinking about. And you probably, I would love to hear your ideas on which of the indirect effects seems so important. Yes, um, I have uh, two more questions. So one in the back uh, first and, and one here. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the question of the indirect costs and benefits. Uh, and this is a little bit of variation of the prior question, but if you have an environment where uh, institutions that over leverage or individuals who overextend themselves get bailed out, that cost of the bailout is perhaps borne by the people that acted prudently and didn't overextend themselves, and then they get taxed or otherwise assessed to pay for those who were imprudent. Isn't that a cost? Can you quantify it? And, and uh, 
uh, isn't this beyond just saying, well, you know, in assessing costs and benefits, you have to consider who pays the cost and who gets the benefit? I mean, I've thought about this a lot, and it's a great question. And in fact, when I started, the FDIC is probably the poster child example for this, because in order to be a bank, you have to participate in the FDIC. But the FDIC makes all the rules, and they, cre they create a lot of cross subsidies through the way they price insurance, that basically the safer banks are paying for the weaker banks. So I agree completely. That has the incidence of a tax. And so I chose not, because I actually didn't have the information to do that estimate, I didn't do it. But I think. It should be done, and I think actually there's people at the FDIC who are sympathetic to even thinking about doing that, but I don't know what the answer is. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously uh, a great question, and it's obviously, you know, is, is kind of the, it's kind of like picking at the scab of, of all the stuff that we've dealt with politically over the time since then, the financial crisis, the distributional implications of these policies are what uh, have driven kind of a very volatile political situation. Uh, it, but ultimately trying to map that into a price or a dollar number is, 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 is not one that I would feel comfortable doing. Not one I'd feel comfortable doing, though I know it, it's not a trivial number. I mean, with, with regard to what Greg was mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. and this whole issue mm -hmm. about the unholy political alliance supporting mm -hmm. Fannie and Freddie, um, one thing that's made it hard to do anything is that Liberals appreciate that when there's subsidies mm -hmm. to low-income housing through Fannie and Freddie, it's off budget. Right. And when it goes through FHA, it's on budget. Yeah. And so there's just been an amazing, um, and that's you know in the spirit of kind <laughs> of, it's a tax for sure, but it's an invisible tax. Right. And it's very hard, there's, there's a ton of that going around, swirling all around, and really quantifying it is important to, will be decades of work. I'll amend my question based upon the last one here to extend it. So first of all, love your papers, Deborah and Greg, as, as Mickey knows, love this data kind of stuff. The, um, the first piece goes to sort of around page 18, 19, Deborah, of your paper. Um, we've had a number of folks, including uh, down at the AEI, yeah. to plug another think tank here, that have talked about how much risk is being loaded onto the FHA right now, right. You know, which they were not aware of. Even Janet Yellen, you know, changed her remarks famously after being informed of that. But second of all, there's this, all this risk math that's a problem. I mean, September 23rd, we had the 20th anniversary of long-term capital management. A lot of that bad math is still out there. There was a lot of diagnosis about the bad risk math that was being used. And then the last question, you just sort of dug into that some more. So how does that systemic problem of the errors in math that's being used here to not capture this, get resolved. And because I used to be in insurance regulation, <laughs> there's an insurance model with reinsurance and state insurance funds that operates differently with a mechanism than what the banks do. As you mentioned, is anybody looking at what they can learn from that and bring it over into this world? So as far as the math, this is an amazing room because you all look awake, but <laughs> mostly puts people to sleep. And you know, I think, um, People like AEI and all the, I mean, this is actually, I think, in the interest of both liberals and conservatives to get the math right. And I think you have to convince people of that. But it can be helpful on both sides. So interestingly, Elizabeth Warren was the head of the Congressional Oversight Panel that called for the fair value estimates of the TARP assistance. Why is that? Well, she was probably not that sympathetic to the banks and wanted to get the truth. So, but I think the truth, so I'm, I'm trying to say that the truth should help left and right and help. But um, I guess the reason I take the time to speak at things like this is to hope that people like people in this room who are so influential in the world will get someone who can make a decision to change the rules. Right. But good luck, you know. <laughs> Ann Mary Mullen, I uh, retired, uh, used to be at the New York Fed. Uh, I'm just sort of trying to step back to the Federal Reserve part of this, since that's where I tend to think about it. And the Dodd-Frank, everybody seems to say, or a lot of people seem to say, has taken away the Fed's flexibility to respond really quickly to a crisis in a way 
that was done for better or worse, in some cases, the long-term consequences were bad, but a lot of people thought the fact that somebody could just be there and almost throw anything at the wall was useful. And uh, can the Fed do that now if there is a crisis that, from what I'm hearing now, sooner or later there's going to be one? Well, let me point out that we do not know if sooner we'll <laughs> see one. So the sooner or later uh, is the key in this. Uh, but uh, the truth is that uh, we, we are not as prepared as uh, I think most of us or all of us would have hoped we would be prepared 10 years after the crisis. Now, in terms of the question you ask, it's actually a quite tricky uh, question about uh, the legal interpretation of the constraints that have been placed on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the Fed. And it's true that the Fed is much more constrained than it was uh, 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 in 2008. That is, that is correct. But it's not true that it's so constrained that it couldn't do anything. There is, there is some wiggle room that, uh, that gives, uh, uh, that gives uh, uh, flexibility to act. So for example, my understanding is that uh, the Fed cannot unilaterally just pick anybody. You know, before the crisis, they could have picked you know, Debbie's firm or Greg's firm and said, oh yeah, 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 whatever. That painting on the wall, that's good collateral. That's right. Here's a billion dollars, right? Now they cannot, the Fed cannot do that anymore. However, uh, the Fed could institute a program that provides uh, similar assistance to the whole industry of uh, uh, Debbie's and Greg's firm. And sometimes maybe that industry only has, uh, well, maybe in Debbie's and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and Greg's, uh, I don't know, and may, maybe Charlie's firm in it. So, so the legal interpretation matters. So I think that there are constraints. Uh, uh, I don't think the limits have been tested. This is one of the uncertainties going forward. Uh, in, in my view, it would be good to clarify these, these uncertainties uh, going, going forward. That would, that would put a, the Fed in a, uh, in a stronger um, uh, position. There's also, a, behind all this, there's a huge philosophical divide between whether you want the expediency of having the Fed do these things or whether it really belongs in the realm of fiscal policy when it involves a large cost and whether Congress shouldn't have the responsibility of providing the authorization. So TARP failed before it was passed. Um, there was, it was possible to convince Congress that if they didn't do anything, um, the world would fall apart. Um, I think there's a cost to having the Fed bear the full responsibility for such enormous costs, a cost to the Fed's independence. So I'm not sure that it's really a bad thing that the world perceives the Fed as not having unlimited authority to do what it takes and um, when really you need congressional and administrative authority to do some things. Okay, and uh, uh, well, we are, we're, we're getting towards the end, so I'm gonna give uh, Charlie, Charlie the, uh, the, last, the last word. Well, I was just gonna elaborate on the last point, but this Wait. is all really tied back up again, so resolution mechanisms versus bankruptcy, and so how, how do you resolve these institutions in one way or another? And um, that hasn't been solved either. And so, um, uh, and it is about whether or not you want to give the Fed un pretty much unconstrained uh, authority to conduct fiscal actions. And that's a huge philosophical question, which I feel very strongly about, but it, it, that's what it is. Okay. Um, let me check with, so Mickey, do we have a couple more minutes uh, yeah. to take yeah, any more guy in the uh, back questions? Has been waiting. Yeah, yeah so let me, the back. let me hold on, let me, yeah, take, take a couple more interventions and then give you guys the final word. Yes. He has addressed, um, is the question of the unintended consequences of some of the mergers, which I use the word loosely, were encouraged as an attempt to solve the problem. Uh, we can talk about Bear Stearns, we can specifically talk about Countrywide, and we can talk about, go, go down a list as far as we want. But if one looks at it from a cash flow standpoint, from one thing, 
the government recouped some of their costs very unexpectedly from the, from, from the buyers. And I think that has created a situation where in the future, if in fact one of the solutions is an attempt to shore up weaker institutions by having them merge with stronger institutions, it's going to create a real reluctance on the part of the buyers to take on the liabilities which come from Justice Department actions and fines and things like that. And I wonder if those have been considered when one really looks at the costs of how these were handled and what it might mean for the future. My, my, you know, my, my personal view is that you're right, that uh, there were some uh, uh, some arranged marriages, shotgun. you know. Yeah, shotgun, uh, uh, <laughs> very arranged, <laughs> uh, super arranged, uh, uh, you know, uh, connections made. Uh, there were probably a preferential price and, you know, at the front end and a huge uh, tax and legal liability on the back end. And I, you know, I, I think we're better off that there was that kind of resolution. It was kind of internalized a little bit, but, you know, I, I, I don't think there'll, it, it would have to be a very shotgun. I think there'll have to be more shotgun, more, more, more shotgun and less arrangement in the future. I don't know. Um, so um, uh, let me uh, let me just end the session by pointing out that this is exactly the uh, the issue that, that Charlie Flosser was uh, was just bringing up at the fact that uh, um, we still don't know what uh, the end point is uh, for the resolution regime. We still haven't tackled the too big to fail uh, problem. All of these things are work in progress, and progress is glaciously uh, glacially slow. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, non, uh, uh, not easy to see uh, at all, uh, which uh, in, in closing the session, um, I'm going to just remind you, this is one of the reasons why, why, why we wanted to pass the message. There is a lot of unfinished work about where we are headed and how we prepare to, uh, to handle the next uh, crisis, which may be sooner or hopefully later, but still we need to prepare for this. So this, is, this session is not the final word of this. We're going to be doing more of this in, uh, uh, in forthcoming meetings of the, uh, of the shadow. So this ends the session. A, um, a housekeeping note, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, uh, all of us. Uh, to